Right, so welcome tonight, everyone, to well, tonight's Go Lang London. Thanks a lot for coming. Um, as you can see on the screen tonight, we're joined by by Andrew Williams um, from Fine uh, about building cross platform, uh, got cross platform graphical uh, views in, in Go. Um, so yeah, thanks for joining us, Andrew. Um, as always, if anyone's got any questions throughout, stick them in the chat function. I'll keep an eye on those, shout them out if needed. Um, I'll be also keeping an eye on the uh, on the waiting room as well, admitting people in. So if anyone knows anyone who's running a minute or two late, let them know I'll still be letting them in uh, as and when. Uh, and this is being recorded as well. So um, this will be going out as always sometime tomorrow afternoon. But um, yeah, that's it from my side. So hand over to Andy uh, if you're ready. Sure, thanks very much for, for the introduction there. Uh, my name is, is Andrew Williams, and it's, uh, it's really great to be able to speak to you uh, all today. Uh, I guess I don't really know any of you, so I'll put a little background in here. I've been a software engineer for probably about 20 years now, working with lots of different projects at uh, different companies, different open source groups. I found myself working on front and back end technologies across mobile, desktop, and web delivery, which has given me a good experience of, of all the different technologies out there over the years and, and different platforms. Uh, but today I want to talk to you particularly about native uh, cross-platform graphical applications with Go, thankfully. Um, before I get into the details about the fine framework uh, toolkits and uh, the various things about it that I'd like to share, I thought it was worth outlining that this was not a GUI toolkit created for Go specifically. In fact, it was something that I thought needed to be created to serve a market, but I didn't know Go when I started working on this. So my experience with Go lasts um, a little bit less than the age of the toolkit, which is around three years by this stage. So I'm no expert on the technologies, but uh, I hope that what I present today will be useful. <clears throat> so, if this wasn't created for Go, why do we need another GUI toolkit? So, having seen all of the different platforms that I described earlier, I feel that I've learned they are all pretty difficult to use. Uh, they, they have good designs for the time in history or the problem that they were solving and uh, some target platforms that are still relevant and, and others have adapted over time. Uh, but I'm not entirely convinced that we have the right tool for the job. Uh, in fact, a lot of uh, application development seems to have moved to the web because it's such a great target for a cross-platform. But I'm also not convinced that that's the absolute best way to build applications, especially rich graphical applications that people want to be performant with, uh, for example, large data or animations um, and other uh, issues like uh, accessibility or offline support. These get a lot harder with, with web delivery. And so there's um, perhaps that's not the one size fits all. And also open source is perhaps one of those areas that, that could be better served by these technologies. The, the toolkits typically used are, are quite old and, and hard to work with. So maybe graphical apps would be better or, or, or more widely used in open source if there was a better toolkit there. So let me just expand on the current challenges. Uh, I understand that this group has people from lots of different backgrounds. So I'm not going to tell you what a graphical application is, but a little bit of information about why building them is hard. And hopefully I'm not telling too many people obvious things here. So like I hinted at, a lot of graphical application development is using legacy technologies. Uh, they were mostly developed from the 1990s. And I think we can all say that technologies moved a long way since then. They're based on really difficult to use thread management. It's often been bolted on or, or evolved from, from the initial versions. Managing memory is also uh, quite challenging. And it's many of them were created before web services were even popular. So integrating with the modern interconnected world is not easy. Also, there could be a really steep learning curve uh, another reason web, I think, is quite so popular is because it's just quick to get up and running with. 
Uh, if you want to, to do something with a native toolkit, there's a language to learn, there's a huge API, and that's something that probably could be improved upon. And supporting multiple platforms can be really difficult. The most elegant APIs are typically by the larger companies for specific platforms, which means that you can't just take your code and run it somewhere else. So with all of these thoughts, um, I took a little while to step back and thought really, there was probably an opportunity here to, to do something better. If we were to start from scratch, what, what could we come up with? And it, it seemed like just uh, an ideal opportunity. And so I started thinking, how would we do this? What would the right language be? And I looked at a few and found that not only was the way that Go was designed and built a perfect fit for solving the challenges that I've described above, but it didn't really have much for graphical um, platform built for it. And uh, rich widgets uh, in, in a toolkit were certainly not available at all. And so the opportunity came together and, and fine, I was born. It's been about three years uh, since then, and we are continuing to push on our ambition of being the best toolkit for easily developing these beautiful native graphical applications for mobile and desktop and, and beyond uh, platforms like the web and TVs and watches and things like that. So that's why I thought we needed to build something. Let me just briefly step you through um, how it is designed, because that's a very important part. If we're going to solve the, the complexity and, and the steep learning curve, the design is split into API and the typical graphical design. I've linked to the bottom here uh, a post that was part of a, a podcast I did for, for the GoTime podcast on the Changelog network, where we described how important it is to make a very careful design when it comes to API, especially. We wanted to be idiomatic and self-documenting, meaning that somebody who has learned Go will just sort of get how it works right away. And naturally being self-documenting, it should be much easier for somebody who doesn't know this to pick it up from the, the websites or from ID auto-completion. We want it to be clean and simple, but also extensible. So you can get up and running quickly, have something that looks great, but then when you want to do more advanced things, it's not getting in your way too much. Everything is possible to some extent or with a certain amount of work. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so the, the user interface, a similar amount of, of thought and care goes into this. Uh, we've been heavily inspired by the material design uh, aesthetic and, and specification that Google has used on many of its platforms. We don't really follow it to the letter, but when it's, it's not exactly the same, it's for good reasons. Maybe um, you know, our platform feels it's slightly different to what they were thinking of when they designed it. And also we're entirely built with vector graphics. Now, whether you're into graphics or not, I'm, I'm sure you've heard it. Uh, it's different to the typical or older pixel-based raster graphics. And basically what it means is that no matter the device that you're going to be showing on, it will adapt and look really crisp and clean instead of blowing up um, the, the bitmap, the pixels of, of older systems to look right uh, and jagged around the edges. We're really drawing it specifically for the device it's running on. And every application built with Fine has a light and a dark theme to match the uh, aesthetics of the system that it's running on. And that can be uh, controlled by the user as well. I show here the settings dialogue that could be packaged as, as part of the toolkit. And it demonstrates that you can scale the text and the application will just look great. Um, you can specify a light or a dark theme or the system default, which will track it. And as night mode kicks in, it might turn your light theme to dark. Um, and you can pick a main color. We've used blue forever, but we know that, that some people would prefer something different. Um, and then also for um, the, the design um, plans, making it really easy to get up and running, uh, it has to have no runtime de dependencies. This is, is pretty good for development because there's not too much to install, but it means that once you've built your application, somebody downloading it doesn't have to install anything at all. As long as they have a, a graphics driver on their operating system functioning correctly, these applications are just going to work with, without any extra. And that's actually quite rare for a cross-platform toolkit. Um, 
I just want to show a little bit about architecture as well for anybody who's thinking about trying this out. We tried to keep naming simple. The, the window is filled by a canvas. Items that can be drawn into that canvas are canvas objects. A container is a canvas object that can contain other canvas objects. You can see in the diagram there how it's laid out a few of them internally. And a widget is basically an interactive canvas object. And that's where most of the power comes in. The standard package contains a lot of widgets and we'll see some later on. Also illustrated in the diagram there. You could see that it's possible to extend widgets by taking a standard one and adding something. And you can also create your own. So if you feel that something is missing or you don't like how one of them looks or works, you can just drop your, your own one in as well. And that could be um, saved into your code base somewhere in your company or your project and reused any number of times. There are a number of packages. So uh, this is to help group things into related areas, improving discoverability and also keeping the code uh, imports low so that you don't have to pull the whole toolkit in if you're not using everything. And these are broadly grouped into two areas. We have those to do with drawing. So Canvas is our package that defines the different drawing operations, such as rectangles, lines, and gradients, and things like that. The container package, as you might imagine, groups together lots of helpful containers, like the split widget or scroll or um, grid container, that, that kind of thing. Layouts support the container package and doing a lot of the calculations to move things around the screen. And the widget package is the big one where all of the interaction um, is, is contained. The second grouping is things that's, that help to build um, complex applications. So the app package is where you enter. That does all of the wiring up, picking the right drivers and so forth to make sure the application works on the platform. We've uh, data binding and data validation for uh, managing data within your application. So it's not lots of boilerplate in your app. And test as well. Test-driven development is something we believe in. We want to support unit testing of graphical applications, uh, which a lot of people I think have, have struggled with and some toolkits don't support too well, but it was important that that was part of it from the beginning. And this structure is all set up so that the driver and the rendering details are completely hidden from the public API. Like I said, it's wired together for you at, um, at runtime, at some of it at compile time. But this means that we could support multiple backends. So your code, you can write once, and this will compile and run to all of the different platforms without modification. And we do that through the modular approach. Uh, so your desktop app will run on mobile or, or web or, or other targets there. And that's just switching out everything that is needed to, to run the app, just doing it dynamically for you. Anyhow, that is, I'm sure, more than enough about how this system works. Uh, why don't I show you a little bit of code to get a taste for what it's like to build? So I don't want to get too deep into the code. Um, that's a pleasure that I'll leave to those who want to explore more, but we'll, we'll cover the Hello World application. So just like any other Go package, you're going to open a new file, package main, because we want to make this executable. And we're going to add some imports. The very first one is the app package. So this is in find.io slash find slash v2 slash app. We moved to v2 for our latest API because we, for the first time ever, had some breaking changes. And of course, Go is encouraging people to put this namespace when there are breaking elements to the API so that we don't break existing applications. And that worked out okay, but we need to apologize for the number right in the middle there, I suppose. I will also import the widget package, which we'll use in a moment. We open the main function as you'd expect and simply call app.new. This is where a lot of the magic happens. I don't like magic a huge amount because it needs to be um, clear how something is, is running in debugging. But in this sense, it's wiring up drivers and, and those things which we should all be able to just forget about. We create a new window with the title hello. If your operating system displays titles, that's going to be above the window. And then we set the content of this window. Here we are using a new label widget, which as you would imagine, just uses that string hello fine to display the content. It's um, then we call show and run. 
which is going to do two things. It shows the window and runs the application through the driver. And um, that's all the code. This is going to display that text on whatever system you're building for. I forgot to include a screenshot of it right here, but it probably doesn't take a lot of imagination to see the text underneath the title bar on your desktop. But how do you build this? I mean, it must be complex, right, to build a graphical app. Well, it used to be even simpler than, than this, but bear with me because since Go 116, you do need modules enabled. Um, so you make your project directory, you set up your module, and then you go get the package, which is find.io slash find slash v2. And that's basically in the installation done. You then edit your Go file using perhaps the Hello World example there or something that you've um, found on the web. And you just type go run and then this package. That, that is actually everything. Uh, there's nothing special about a, a fine app um, in the way that you, you run it. The standard tools all work. If you are on um, a Linux system, there may be some... If you're on Windows, then you might not have the right compiler. We find sometimes they're not, not shipped, but we've got documentation that I'll come back to if you need to troubleshoot at all, but mostly it will just work. And of course, alongside your Go UI file, you would write your UI tests and Go test is going to run your unit tests for the graphical app exactly like you would normally run unit tests. In fact, it's going to run them entirely in memory. So it's doing graphical testing of your application without needing to use the screen. So there's none of that uh, taking hold of the cursor and throwing it around the window that you may have experienced with graphical testing of, of web apps. So you've, you've built an app, you've run it, it looks great, but how do you, how do you share it? Well, we'd help with packaging and distribution as well. It's a little bit more complicated than simply um, sharing the binary of a regular Go app because it needs graphical metadata attached as well. So you would get a helpful um, fine command to assist with this. Uh, my, my two lines appear to be one here, but it's a, a go get once again. This time it's grabbing a command line helper tool. And then we're using that to package. That command by default is just going to build your app and then put the metadata around it for the current operating system. So on my Mac, what I see after doing that is my app.go and my app.app. And if I open that in a file manager, I double click the icon and the application runs like you would think. If I wanted to build for another platform, I could specify the OS as part of the find package, or I could use a Go OS environment like you would do for the standard Go tools. And after doing that, I would see a tar GZ file, which would be the Linux, uh, well, one of the Linux distribution formats that could be then adapted to the various different platforms that, that there are um, for Linux distributions. Or if actually what you want is just to install it into your local system, but as a desktop application instead of as a command line, then fine install, like go install, is going to just do the right thing. And so here in the screenshot, you can see that I have used find install in the setting, find settings directory, and that has installed it as an application. And that's it then appearing in the search results when I type in set for, for settings on my Mac. But what about mobile? I mean, uh, that's got to be really complicated. So uh, we felt that it was necessary to try and make that just as easy. And in fact, it is. Uh, if you specify the operating system as iOS and uh, you're on a, a Mac because that's a, a stipulation of Apple's licensing, uh, then you will see a similar results, so an app folder in your uh, current directory, but that is for your iPhone. And you can then install that onto your, onto your phone directly. If you wanted to target Android, you would do the same thing and you would see an APK file appear, which can then be dragged and installed onto your Android device. And there's standard tools there hinted uh, to use the um, Apple provided or, or Android tools to, to install them. There are drag and drop UIs if, if you install the, the IDEs for those platforms as well. And there you can see an image of nine of, of uh, 
the fine apps that I had been working on at some point installed on an iPhone. Additionally, if you wanted to distribute to the stores, you would use the fine release command and it would then ask you for some certificate details. So you would sign up to the developer program, download the certificates that you need. But after that, it's going to take care of everything. And then you would drag it onto the web page or the uploader application instead of onto the device. And all of a sudden, your find based application built entirely with Go is available in the stores for the mobile platforms. So I just wanted to show as well some of the widgets available. It's really difficult to do that without uh, tapping through a huge application or showing massive screenshots, but here's a taster. It's showing some of the input widgets uh, using the light theme. And we have a, a tree view on the left and pretty standard stuff. And equivalent then in the dark theme is going to look like this. Uh, this is a different screen, of course. This is our a demonstration of, of our form capabilities, which shows some of the uh, data validation as well, which could be wired in. And the form is then going to show you the results of any failed validations. Uh, more recently, we've added some uh, additional functionality on top of the somewhat interactive widgets, of which the collection is, is growing. And in fact, um, we're finding the community wants to, to add quicker than our release process. So we're work, we have a, an extensions repository uh, called FineX, where you can find um, more widgets than are core to the system, and they may upstream at some point. Um, one of the things we added is animation. And if I can just play this here, you can see that uh, this is um, very poorly animating, I'm afraid. I, I, I can tell you that's a, a very smooth um, flow when it's running on your device. And that's demonstrating color and move and the different curves that are included in the animation package. And that's really just two or three lines of code for each animation. And you can apply that to, to anything in your UI and it's going to render an efficient um, manner appropriate uh, so that everything runs smoothly. Another thing that we um, added just in the 2.0 release, so earlier this year, is data binding. Now, this is something that is common in, in many advanced toolkits. What it means is that you can control the contents of, of various widgets and elements of your application without having to actually code, now set the value, uh, get the value when it changes, save it somewhere. And these can be connected to different data sources. So you could bind to something in memory, you could um, bind to a value that has been read from a file. One of my favorite helpers is to be able to bind to the user preferences. So the preferences API, I didn't mention, added last year, it allows you to save simple user preference information. And the data binding illustrated here means for the, for the user preferences, um, which is associated with the app, so the second parameter. Take the, the key note number five and bind my entry to the data stored in the preferences with that key. And I've used a picture underneath to illustrate a notes app, which has got a simple list on the left and an entry, a multi-line entry on the right. And there's very little in that application because when you tap on one of the items, it binds the entry to a different preference, a uh, different preference string, which means that it loads the value and refreshes it on screen. And if the user then edits the contents of that note, it immediately gets saved back into the user preferences. And so you didn't need to write any code to load the data, save the data, or manage the states in between. So this has been a really big productivity boost for many apps. Now, I know that that's probably taken um, most of the time um, allocated to, to talk about this toolkit, but before we wrap up, I wanted to show more um, real demos, I suppose, of, of what are possible here. Um, I didn't want to jump out and switch through multiple different applications, uh, just in case the demo gods weren't with me today, but I've got a few that I can show um, through the, uh, the screenshot uh, approach. So this first one 
is a music player app uh, by one of our core contributors who did a fantastic job, some custom widgets, but mostly regular um, standard items. And this, the screenshots from um, fine a, a couple of versions ago, but it still looks quite similar. I think that's just a really nice use of, of various elements. Uh, recently, a member of the community came in and said that they had made a, a remote Redis management application, which is pretty cool. That's got so much power in it. And they're just using this um, application graphical layer uh, to, to provide simple access to the, the powerful libraries underneath. Uh, a project that I did a little while ago was to build a, a medical imaging viewer. Uh, I realized how expensive that software can be on, for license costs and typically not very, um, well, not at all cross-platform and it would possibly be licensed per a different platform. So we put that application together in a weekend and, and that's it running on a, a $50 touch screen connected to a Raspberry Pi showing just how easy it is to build this stuff and distribute it um, pretty cheaply. So hopefully that's um, moving uh, a couple of conversations in the medical imaging space. Recently, I, I built a chess application uh, that's got some nice graphical elements to it. And it was demonstrating the animation as well. When you tap a piece and move it, it's going to animate across the board to the new location. Uh, one of my all time favorites, uh, somebody in the Go community made a fantastic uh, Game Boy runtime uh, in pure Go. Uh, we found that it would be nice to put a bit of um, user uh, interface around it. And what you see there is um, it running in mobile mode. On the desktop, it would just be the screen with the, the surround. But that is, is uh, as it would appear on a mobile device, and the buttons are, are touchscreen buttons, so you're able to, to play the game as though it was on the original device. Although without the haptic feedback, it's possible to slip off the buttons. And uh, most recently, I've, I've been working also on a, a terminal. Uh, this, was, this was a lot of fun. I don't know what it is uh, about being a developer and liking terminals, but that was a sort of step into the pro developer tools area as well. And I think that's rendered really nicely. Uh, it's one of the places that vector graphics are not used very much, but the application, I think, has, has gone quite well. And of course, there's many applications available. These are just some of them. And I'll, I'll show you a, a link later. Everything that I've discussed today is um, open source and freely available. Uh, a lot of the applications that are being created are internal to, to business groups. Um, that's not something that I can share, unfortunately, but that's just a, a taster. Uh, one last one. Um, some of our group have also been working on a, a full desktop environment uh, called Fine Desk. We're not necessarily the most imaginative at naming some things. Um, so this is a, a Linux desktop environment, which uh, many of you may be interested in, but it was a chance, given that we had reimagined a graphical toolkit for building applications, we thought we could reimagine the code running a desktop as well, because it suffered similar legacy challenges and maintenance issues. We wanted to see if we could really speed things along in that area as well. And that's proving to be quite uh, an interesting project too. So lastly, just a moment there on, on where things are going from here. Uh, we, we continue to want to be the best uh, toolkit for easily developing beautiful native graphical applications for all of these platforms. And I hope I've illustrated to some extent how that is possible and maybe sparked a little imagination. If there's something that you think is, is missing, then maybe it's, it's one of these elements. Uh, in, in five or six weeks, we're releasing our next big release, which includes cloud synchronization, which means the preferences API is going to save it to all of your devices, not just to one, along with rich text, some life cycle. And um, we're aiming to have a, a web drive ready for public consumption as well. So that's across even more devices. 2.2 later this year, we're, we're looking at drag and drop and adding system tray and other popular requested items. That's still to be confirmed because all of our planning is, is a community effort. It's an entirely volunteer project. So we, we work on the stuff that really interests um, whoever's available. And then next year, we're going to be publishing version three. And this is focusing on internationalization and accessibility and multimedia. Three of the really big things that are somewhat there, but not fully. Uh, and so there's, 
parts of the world that really don't get a first class experience with this yet. And we're, we're trying to fix that along with doing a good job for, for um, partially sighted or accessibility technology type um, setups too. And multimedia, we would love video in here, but licensing is really tricky. Everything we're doing is under the, the BSD um, highly permissive open source license and the codecs that go with multimedia don't necessarily fit well with that. Oh, goodness me, that's that's been a half hour that's flown quite quickly. Uh, I have a couple of links here um, for anybody that wants to learn more, but we'll answer questions in a moment as well. There is a tour if you'd be interested in, in just a high level overview. We have a developer website there, developer.find.io, where all of our documentation is, lots of tutorials. We have a YouTube channel if you prefer to, to learn over video. And if you're interested in contributing, everything is open source on our GitHub organization. And that's the, the main toolkit there. We're also um, planning our own conference. We do this, um, I think, for the last two or three years. And the next one's on the 9th of July. Uh, we're looking for speakers, but also attendees if, you, if you're interested. Uh, there is a book out there. Um, I previously wrote about all the GoGooies I could find. This one is specifically about the Find Toolkit. And there is uh, an apps listing, which is all of the known open source or all the open source apps that people would like to have listed available in one place. Lastly, if you're thinking about using this in your business or evaluating it or, or would just like to get in touch, um, I'm Andy at finelabs.com. Fine Labs is a company that we set up to manage the, the finances and to support the project going forward. So it was more than just a bunch of volunteers, but something that we could see, you know, really being a, um, a big part of graphical development into the future. Thank you so much, everybody, for your attention. I hope that's been interesting. And yeah, I'd love to, to take any questions that, that you have. Thanks, Andrew. Um, one question that just popped up in the chat about 10 minutes ago, so I might as well start there. Um, Abhishek asked, uh, is there a visual designer for the UI D&D to create widgets? Um, yeah, well, there's one that's a work in progress. Um, I've been working on it with, with a couple of contributors just on my own GitHub account. Um, it's called, uh, I think, Fine Builder. It is graphical. Um, we've not got drag and drop built in there just yet, but um, you sort of tap the thing you want and, and um, sorry, highlight where you want to put it and tap it and add it. Um, it's not fully feature complete, which is why it's not on the public on the, on the main project yet, but it does allow you to, to visualize the containers, the layouts and how the widgets fit together. Um, we found that the, the various layouts that can be used is one of the hardest things to learn because we've really simplified layout. Um, which means it's diff different to how other toolkits have worked. And given that they all work different, depending on your background, you might um, have a lot to learn or forget. So we're looking to have that more visible and um, include it probably in a, a, an actual uh, development environment that covers everything uh, later this year or, or early next year. But yeah, get in touch and I can show you the details or, or just find my stuff on, on GitHub. Great, and, and Richard then has asked, inevitably with cross-platform toolkits, you want to avoid the lowest common denominator problem. How does Fine help you manage these lower level calls to, to the underlying window manager slash operating system? Yeah, um, so that's, I mean, as you say, it's obviously something that's important. Um, our first approach to not falling for the lowest common denominator was to build our own widgets. Um, I, I felt the first trap was to use what the, system provides, and then you really have only a small um, overlap of, of things supported in, in different areas. So we built it from scratch. So that gets around that one. Mostly the approach to access lower level stuff has been through Go's APIs. So whether it's the syscall package or using Cgo to connect to stuff, that is technically possible to do most things. Recently, we've seen really great APIs like um, there's a library recently published to give you a Go API to Apple's um, Objective-C APIs. And we're evaluating including those, um, but mostly um, we're, we're going with the tr tried and tested standard library for, for accessing those things. It, it just seems to be enough for most cases. The only um, complication there is that we don't give you visibility 
of the, the low level um, driver elements like why, what does the operating system call my window ID and things like that. And that's intentional because we can't guarantee that internal drivers won't change going forward. So our public APIs are very carefully chosen to be guaranteed going forward. So anything that you do under the covers is you know, slightly at risk of, of um, changing unexpectedly, but we do try our best not to break anything at all. Any other questions? Oh uh, yeah, Phil's just asked, can you talk a little about synchronization? E.g. can I keep my logic in Go routines or would I need to write callbacks for the tool kit, for the tool kit to call? Uh, absolutely. So the, one of the design principles really was let's break this idea that your graphical code has to run in a graphical thread. And so what, what we do is in the drivers, we take control of the events and we take control of the drawing so that your code can operate anywhere you want. And as long as you're using the standard methods on our widgets, you can call them from any Go routine and it will just do the right thing very safely. We do offer field access. If you need um, to do lots of things at once, it could be helpful to change lots of parameters and then, and then apply them in one go. Um, in that situation, it requires a little synchronization and we're working on a way to make, make that a lot easier in an upcoming release. Um, but for the most part, common use cases and the design overall is you just never have to worry about it again. And we, we embrace goes concurrency and, and the use of go routines absolutely everywhere. And I think actually there was a demo I created a while ago that uh, perhaps is aged and I need to bring back to life, but it was, um, I think it was a simple RSS reader, but you just, you booted the app and then it spun up a thing that read the articles off a feed. And each time it discovered one, it just said, add this to the UI. And, and uh, it was simple to read code and the concurrency was all handled internally. It was really quite elegant. If I can follow that one up, um, does that include, for example, if I wanted to do custom rendering, could I do that in my own Go routine? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so there's, there's various different ways that you can do custom rendering and how you do it might impact the, the, the way uh, forward. So the way that um, that Fine is built and other retained mode graphical toolkits is that it tries to remember everything that's on screen or everything that should be on screen. And so when it refreshes, it does the minimum it needs to, which means that rendering is kind of a hidden detail. And so to, to do rendering, you need to expose that through here's a list of the things that I want to render, like it's a circle with a line and a rectangle positioned in these ways. And that's using the standard API. Um, or you could decide you've got really um, complex requirements and you want to draw, draw using a different um, API, really rich graphical API of some sort perhaps, in which case you can export to an image uh, and that can be consumed by the toolkit uh, as a, a simple image that's scaled to fit the screen or what we call a raster image, which marries one image in your image, one pixel in your image to one output pixel on your screen. Um, if, if folk don't get the difference, don't worry about it, but um, it's, it's a, uh, kind of a powerful to be able to do both of those things. Now, in those cases, you can set the new item to be displayed and that is completely safe on all threading models, or you can update um, the one currently on screen, uh, which is much quicker, but of course does uh, tread into the be careful what you're doing and make sure we're not drawing at the time. And, and that area there is what we're trying to really tidy up in the next release. People do it, it's very fast. Technically, there is a race condition in there. Um, it's not caused issues yet, but we need to resolve it. And um, we have some ideas about APIs to make that easier. Great. Anyone else got any questions? Looks looks like that's everyone. Um, so yeah, if it is, I mean, thanks thanks for a great talk, Andrew. Um, you know, it was really interesting. Uh, this has been recorded, as I mentioned at the start. So uh, the recording will come out tomorrow, 
We'll add in a couple of these links as well for anyone to follow um, to, to all the documentation and things around that. Um, but obviously, you know, have, have a look at Fine Online, have, have a look at Andrew, uh, you know, see, see what they're doing in a bit more detail, have a play around for yourself. Um, if anyone wants to talk about the Go market in general, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Happy to speak about anything. Um, and otherwise, keep an eye on the event. We'll have a few more event page, the meetup page, have a few more coming up over the next weeks and months. Um, so hope you can join us. But for now, thanks, everyone. Hope everyone's well. And yeah, see you soon. Cheers, guys. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.